Welcome to the eighth installment of Maddie's Baking Book Club. Today, I am baking a macaron inspired by the book, The Last Tale of the Flower Bride. Now, in this book, our two female main characters are named Indigo and Azure, and we have a lot of references to blue colors and the fairy tale blue beard i believe is the name of it so a lot of blue so obviously i needed to make some blue macaron shells and i also wanted it to be a very dark blue but i didn't want it to be just like a very normal shade of blue so i decided to add a mixture of blueberry violet and black to try to achieve a really deep sort of blue with just that hint or undertone of purple or violet to kind of represent these different shades of blue I am using the French method for meringue as I usually do for small batches in my home kitchen and I just am whipping through this process so if you want more information about making macaron shells make sure to check out one of my more normal macaron tutorials. I am going to pipe this macaron batter then that I've gotten to that ribbon stage onto a Teflon baking sheet. Just regular circle shells here because all of the decoration is going to be painted and glued on with royal icing. I could have maybe done something to it in the beginning or played around with the shape more, but I wanted the blue color to be the focal point of the shell itself and then have all of the different layers of texture coming on later. And then we're going to have a filling that, you know, is really, I think, good to fit into a normal circle shell. So let's just continue on here. I'm piping these. I'm going to rest them and bake them just like always. If you are using a lot of food colorant like I am, I do recommend using a lot of powdered food colorant or you can also do a mix of powder and gel food colorant. If you just use gel food colorant, be very careful because that adds a lot of moisture to your macaron shells and your bake could go awry or mature very strangely as there is going to be so much moisture. So these are going to bake and then I'm going to prepare everything I need for the decoration while these are baking. So in this story, The Last Tale of the Flower Bride, we have these two female main characters and then a male main character, and we're hearing from the male character and one of the female characters in alternating chapters. Because of these two women who were so close and yet had their own kind of individuality in these some very specific ways, I knew I wanted to create some painted uh, line art designs of women's faces and I wanted it to be a little bit vague and mysterious, again stemming from the characters in this book. Um, and I also wanted them to be different enough and yet the same. So I have two different kinds of line art face designs that I'm creating. I am just using a very small paintbrush. I am using a paintbrush that is made for nail art. So it is really fine um, and really great to paint on macrons with. And then I am using some gold luster dust um, and a little bit of almond extracts just to thin it down and create this sort of gold paint for myself. These designs were really hard to paint. I practiced a lot on paper first and I was really getting the hang of it with my pen and then when I switched over to a paintbrush, oh my gosh, it was so much harder, but I think you do get the gist of it and I was really happy with the end result, but if this is something you are trying to recreate on your Mac, Macrons, I really recommend practicing first with a pen and paper and then with a paintbrush on paper before you get to your macaron shells just so you know kind of what to expect. After I paint 
all of my faces. Luckily for us, um, using a luster dust and uh, almond extract or alcohol really does not take long to dry. Like even in a few seconds, it will probably be mostly dry. So that will be really quick. And then I'm going to move on to a little bit of royal icing. I have just little tiny dabs on there, little dots of a, a tan royal icing that I made. The color isn't important, but just in case it showed through a little bit, I want it to be a little bit more neutral than a very stark white. And I'm gluing on some edible dried flower petals. Again, the last tale of the flower bride. We have so many references to fairy tales, one of them being the story of a man who um, ends up marrying this uh, sort of not quite human woman she's created out of flowers and so I wanted that is a theme that is recurring throughout the book um, and so I wanted to demonstrate that and again kind of play into this magical uh, whimsical mysterious female form on the macaron shell so I decided to have the dried flowers almost as if they're in like a breeze or something blowing across the female face that I painted on. So I'm just using the royal icing as a glue. If you wanted to use a chocolate or something else, you absolutely could. Um, just make sure that if you are using it in a really you know thick amount that you are covering that all up or you will see the royal icing through the bottom. For the most part, I hand placed the flowers on, but I did play around with also just like dipping my macaron shell into my bowl of flowers. For the filling, there were so many recurring moments of having a bowl of milk or milk and honey or all these different things for the fae um, because these two girls really wanted to go to the other world join the other world they wanted to be magical creatures themselves and so i decided to make a honey based unglazed buttercream and keep that sort of milk milk and honey theme throughout the inside of my macaron to match the book um i wanted to keep this very simple and i found a local honey that was a vanilla honey so I am not adding in any additional flavors so all of the flavor is coming from the, hun the vanilla honey in here and then you will be able to taste the milk and creaminess from the milk and butter um, in the final uh, macaron. So for an unglaze based buttercream, I am starting off obviously by making an unglaze. I just had my milk, cream, honey in my saucepan, let that heat up, and then I'm tempering it into my egg yolks. Then everything goes back into my saucepan where I will continue to cook this whisking pretty continuously until it reaches about 82 to 85 degrees Celsius. Then, because that is so, so hot, I am I'm going to need to pause making my buttercream, allow that to cool off. I want it to get to below 30 degrees Celsius before I whip it into my butter. Otherwise, my butter is going to melt and then we won't have a buttercream. We will just have a milky buttery soup. Once that mixture is cooled down though, then I can whip up my butter till it's really light and fluffy, pour that unglaze in there and then continue to mix it. When you are making an unglaze based buttercream it you do have a point especially in the beginning when you combine everything together when it really looks broken and gross and more like scrambled eggs especially if you have those egg yolks in there but I promise you it will come together you just have to keep mixing it do not 
panic. As soon as I have this buttercream finished, we'll be ready to go. So I am going to switch from the whisk attachment over to a paddle attachment just to make sure I have the creamiest buttercream possible. Then I am going to lay out all my macaron shells, get my buttercream into my piping bag, and then I have one final ingredient going into these macarons. In the story, one of the girls, Indigo, offers Azur, the other girl, a platter at one point with all of these plums on it. And I believe in the story they were golden plums, but I decided to use any uh, plums that I could have. And I decided instead of creating a compote or doing anything crazy with them, I just got some really good quality prunes, which of course are dried plums. And I am going to put them that on the inside of my macaron because it was in the story a representation of fairy fruit or something that was a very like dangerous and forbidden sort of food of the other world and that was such an important theme in the story I wanted to include that as well so I am just going to finish filling these macaron shells with the milk and honey buttercream putting a half of the plum on the inside and then I will sandwich them up and give them a chance to mature in my refrigerator with the painted decoration or the little bit of royal icing and a uh, flower decoration decoration, all of that, it's not going to cause any change for how quickly the macarons mature. These will be just like normal. The dried fruit on the inside, as you can see, these prunes are relatively soft here, but they do not have like a drippy liquid in them as a regular fresh fruit would if I just put a slice of a plum in there. These might get quite soggy if you were to do that, but with this dried fruit, it will be perfect. You will still get a really nice difference in texture and flavor on the inside, but it will not cause the shells to become soggy or overly matured very quickly. So after sandwiching these up, I will get them into my refrigerator until they are ready to serve. I really enjoyed the challenge of creating this macaron gel. I'm so happy with the end result, both in flavor and especially the appearance, even though the line art design was very, very hard to get onto my macaron shells, I, I think it went pretty well. So I do have a book discussion with Caitlin here for you about The Last Tale of the Flower Bride. Just please know there are a few themes of uh, violence and death, um, especially near the the end of the story. It is a sort of uh, magical realism sort of story that weaves in fairy tales into the real world, uh, but it is not a Disney sort of fairy tale. It is a more uh, traditional sort of fairy tale. There might be some themes that are triggering to some folks out there, so please do listen at your own discretion. Okay, on to the book discussion. Hi, Caitlin. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> I'm happy to be here again. Yeah, so you were here for the second ever Maddie's Baking Book Club discussion. And so I'm happy that you can be back. For those who haven't watched our previous uh, video, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, I'm Caitlin Brame. I'm Maddie's sister-in-law. And I guess who I am for the purposes of this discussion is I'm very into fairy tales and folklore. Mm -hmm. And in theory, I have a podcast about it, but it hasn't been you do. in many years. You do. <laughs> <laughs> it still exists should anyone want to listen to past episodes. You have two seasons released? Is that accurate? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there are, there are many episodes, um, should folks be curious. Um, so how did you get interested in folklore and fairy tales to start off with? I don't know. I mean, 
it ties in very well with this book, but like, it's something that I feel like a lot of us are just interested in, um, especially as children. Like it's a, a glimpse into a magical world that, um, you know, they're presented as just stories. They're not real, but there's something about them that feels like maybe that's not really true somehow. Like maybe there is some reality there. And I feel like it very much ties in with like a phase that many kids go through um, slash maybe never outgrow like the ancient Egypt mythology phase where you're like, whoa, like there were people that like believed in these like spectacular things and built these like spectacular pyramids and like fairy tales and folklore feel like that. But our evidence is just like in books rather than like yeah. pyramids. Yeah. As you were saying that, I just triggered the memory that like as a 10 year old, I was fully like magic isn't real but on my 11th birthday I might get a letter from Hogwarts like (laughs) yeah for real like part of my brain was like you never know right (laughs) yes exactly (laughs) yeah okay so before we get into the book discussion I'm obviously not in my regular apartment I'm in my parents home and there's a lot of air traffic noise and also acorns falling so (laughs) audio (laughs) weirdness things happening That is the reason. Um, So yes, back to the book. Um, Can you give a little overview in the beginning? And then we'll get into some spoilers later. So if you haven't listened to or read the book, um, you can maybe listen to this overview and then run away before we (laughs) spoil the ending for you. Um, So yeah, can you tell us what was this book about? Yeah, it is a very um, spoilery thing to try and say what it's about um I didn't actually know anything really going into it and I would recommend not knowing much but I'll tell you enough that it won't spoil it for you if you still want to read it and you haven't um so this is the last tale of the flower bride by Roshni Chakshi and it is a story told in dual narration alternating narration so the first one is narrated by a character called the bridegroom, um, who never actually gets a name in the no. story. No. And no one calls him bridegroom. It's just like the heading of his chapter narration. Yep. Um, he is a an academic scholar of like classics and mythology and fairy tales. So my guy. And he, <laughs> like as part of his work, will frequently have to be in contact with like collectors and like you know like small libraries and curators and whatever to like get access to manuscripts related to his research so um in one of these instances he meets indigo maxwell castaneda Mm -hmm. and um that is the beginning of his narration as he is telling the story Mm -hmm. of like when he and Indigo meet, and they're in their late 20s, early 30s. Yeah, like they're then. like not young, but not. Right. They're like yeah. full adults. Yep, full adults. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so he's telling basically like the story of him and her and like when she came into his life. Yeah. Um, so she is like an heiress of some like family fortune, powerful family. Yeah, like family. hotels, but also like a lot of other things. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. kind of mysterious. Um, as like most like rich, powerful women, she is mysterious and she has this sort of like dangerous, like siren, like energy. Um, but like she takes interest in him right away because he is like a mythological folklore guy. Like he understands the language of mythology and fairy tales and like the rules and like the tropes Mm -hmm. and like he even says this is all like within the first couple of pages of the book no it like jumps right in yeah yeah he even says like at one point in their like initial conversation he's talking with her about like some like myth blah 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 and then he like pulls the conversation more toward like real world like present day what's happening sort of things because this is a modern story like it's happening now um, and he immediately sees as her eyes like glaze over. Like she, she has not no talk about interest. It at all. Yeah. Yeah. So he's like, okay, great. The only way I can like keep the attention of this like incredible siren in front of me is to like keep the conversation focused on fairy tales and mythology. And like, that's my jam. Like, I can do that. Yeah. So the relationship becomes sort of this like, almost like game like they have like sexy role playing of like mythology and whatever and at one point 
I forget which myth in particular they're talking about, but like many myths have these like agreements. She, oh, they, they end up getting married. Mm-hmm. Again, it happens within the like, first right couple away. pages. Yeah, yeah. You don't know um, that. Yep. Yeah. And she says like, listen, we can have a really happy life together. Like I'm in it with you here, but like I have secrets and for us to be happy, like you have to promise me that you're never going to like look into these secrets or ask me about my secrets or mm-hmm. like anything like that. And he's like, okay, great. Yeah, like, we all yeah, the same. whatever. Um, yeah, and so, so they're like really happy for a while and he's doing his like scholarly things and yep. she's doing her heiress things. And then one day she gets word that her aunt who um, was like her primary guardian for like most of her life um, is dying. And she has to go to her, to her aunt who like currently lives in her childhood home, which everyone refers to as the house of dreams, mysteriously. Um, It's actually a mansion and it's a mansion on um, an island off the coast of Washington state. And um, so the bridegroom is going to go with her there. And um, he's like very excited because like he's seeing his partner's childhood home for the first time, but also like he's getting a glimpse into like the realm of her secrets that like he is not allowed to talk to or, like ask her about or anything but, but he's sort of door. being invited into yeah. it yeah yeah and he was like i was content not asking like of my own right. permission right now, and he really was like he yeah. didn't ask he okay yep for three yeah. years he was okay yeah and yeah. then yeah, and then and it all he sort divorced. of gets let in, <laughs> no. and like one of the glimpses of a secret that's part of this, gl- like letting into the house of dreams and her past is that she had a best friend, a childhood like best, best, inseparable friend named Azur, mm-hmm. who was like very much there at the house all the time and was like with Indigo all the time, and she just like disappeared from the narrative. Yep. So like there's this character Azur and he's like I like Indigo has never mentioned her so like yeah. don't know who she is but then Azur starts narrating the alternating chapters and Azur is telling the story of her and Indigo from the age that they met which was 10 mm-hmm. basically through like their adolescence. Living way back in time through her narration yeah. and through more like present day with some flashbacks to the past with right. the bridegroom's narration. So we're kind of right. merging the storylines as yes. you get further into the book, which I loved. I thought that yes. was so great. <laughs> I, I love an alternating timeline and narration. So you mentioned that there are a lot of different like fairy tales and folklore is mentioned throughout this whole book. And there are a lot of yeah. you know fairy tales that have maybe similar themes that were referenced at different times. I obviously know way less about fairy tales than you do. And so most of the names and Indigo has a like pet name for Azure, said cat skins, or there Mm -hmm. were all these little bits of knowledge that you could glean. And sometimes the bridegroom would fully narrate the entire story. And that was, you know, wonderful. But sometimes, especially in the beginning, you just get like a little hint Mm -hmm. And that was interesting to me, but I also didn't know where the story was going with it because Mm -hmm. it didn't hold any other meaning to me. I was like, oh, okay, I think we're going to learn more about that, but I don't know. Did you have a lot of prior knowledge when they would say things like cat skins? Like, did you know the story? Um, I was vaguely aware of cat skins. It's a horrific, (laughs) it's like a really gross, like incestuous, like gross fairy tale. And that's the thing is like most of the fairy tales, like when we say fairy tales in this conversation and related to this book, it's the dark stuff. It's not Disney. Yeah, no. Like both adult indigo is into the disturbing stuff and child indigo is into that. Yeah. Um, which is also how she and Azura bond is they're both into this like magical realm. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting that you say that because as I was reading the book, I was like, okay, this feels very heavy handed. Like we get it. It's a <laughs> book about fairy tales. Like you don't have to throw it in my face this okay. much. Okay. Um, so I guess yes is the answer. But then I quickly realized like, oh, if it's a fairy tale, like if this is a fairy tale, this book, which it is. Yeah. Um, and it's like going to be super meta about the fact that it's a fairy tale, then it has to be overdone. Yeah. Um, so I like 
had a moment of frustration and then I was like, no, 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 this is really good. So I think one of the central fairy tales beyond Catskins, which is like specifically named mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is um, Bluebeard, which yeah. is also kind of named in yep. the story. I think they yep. refer to it by one of the other uh, names that it I is. I think they talk about it. I think yeah. that's like the page, but, and that yeah. was specifically related to this title and kind of a theme with the flower right. bride. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Flower bride is um, not really a bluebeard story, but like the color blue is so prominent in the story. Like the two yes. main yes. girls are indigo and azure and like everything is described as blue all the time. Yes. Um, and it's kind of like a reversal of the bluebeard when like the bridegroom man narrator is not a uh, bluebeard indigo is bluebeard mm -hmm. in this story so like it's it's a cool like inverse of a lot of the fairy tales um but it's like it plays in this world where like all the characters kind of know the rules of yeah. what a fairy tale is and they're like trying to like apply it to their real lives or they're like going about their real lives as if like okay well in order to do this we have to make a sacrifice or like we have to have like a certain agreement that like you and I, we wouldn't be like, okay, Maddie, well, in order for me to sit down and have this conversation with you, I have to cut off some of my hair <laughs> to like appease the fae spirit so that they won't mess with our technology. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah. like these girls very much do that. And at first it's kind of like, it's cute. It's like, yeah, like so 10 year old girls. Like, yes. Yeah. Yep, it seems yeah. really normal. Mm -hmm. They're going to make like rock soup in the backyard. They're going to yep. like play around with all these things. But then it becomes like they never let it go. And it's like, oh, like you really actually believe this. And like as a reader, you're like, wait, is this real or is this pretend? Like, right. How much of like the fairy taleness of this story is like, a, are we anchored in reality still or are, yes. is this really is turning into a fairy tale? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And also as the girls get older and as we are hearing more and more from Azura, they start becoming, you know, young women, they're teenagers. Mm -hmm. We really see that like push and pull and that balance, that threshold of like, is it just reality or is it yeah. a fairy tale? And as Azura tries to push those boundaries, Indigo kind of switches from being like, just the friend soul sister person to being like a master manipulator yeah and in those moments you're kind of like again wait is this fun and games or like is right. azure's like a in a spider's trap like can does she want to leave can she leave like right. what is going on here and yeah i yeah i found that to be very intrigue horrifying but like intriguing <laughs> truly. yeah yeah it feels like everything in this story has that duality of like wait is this just like a beautifully written like metaphor thing or is this actually real like same thing with the house is yeah. the house actually sentient yeah or do they just like feel that like the house talks to them sometimes because like as a child you could see how it being like okay now pretend like I like the house said this to me and then like eventually like you play that so often that it like sort of becomes true like you like build your own superstitions about things and then even like right. going into your teenage years you're like oh well if I like I have to do this like I don't really believe it but like what if what if I do get that letter from Hogwarts <laughs> right. except it's a bad thing <laughs> or even like I, not for like a whole house, but I feel like even just like in my own kitchen, like if I'm like using my mixer for hours and hours, I'm, I'll be like, it's okay. You can do it. And I don't, yeah. I don't believe that my mixer can like understand me, but I still have this like inherent need to be like, I'm going to talk to this physical object as if it is <laughs> sentient. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so it kind of, yeah, it has that feeling of like how much of it is just, yeah. Oh, I'm sad. So the house is sad. I yeah. don't actually want to leave. So the house doesn't want me to leave. I feel yeah. unsure of myself. Yeah. Or is the house actually magic? Like is the right. aunt Tati like a witch? Like what? Right. What is going on here? But that's the thing too is like me being the type of person I am who like, yeah, I do tend to believe in magic more than a regular person might. <laughs> like all of these things that are magical, I'm like, okay, 
is this literal in the like school of which is sort of like literary liter literal yeah is this real in the sense that like like for example when azur first meets indigo yeah. indigo is like putting out a bowl of milk and honey yes in her yard like as an offering to the fairies yes and i'm like that is an actual real thing like if you believed in fairies like if you were nurturing your like fey spirits yep. a bowl of milk and honey is like an actual offering that you would make right, right. and like <laughs> Like, if you believe in, like, an animate world, like, your house absolutely does have a certain amount of sentience. It's not going to, like, literally talk to you or, like, the banister is going to move around like an arm. But, like, I mean, I believe houses have sentience. So, like, there are, like, things where I'm, like, sure, yeah. But, like, what is real? Like, do, does the author mean it in that way, the way that I think of it as real? Or, like, are we moving into, like, a overly like fantasy realm and that's never clear which i right. love yeah another thing i wanted to ask you about so you mentioned that the bridegroom mm -hmm. like his chapters the man's chapters are titled the bridegroom and yeah. in the book um he's mostly referred to at like by indigo like as my love or you know like a pet name or something mm -hmm. and i feel like when he gets to the house people just like straight up start talking to him like nobody maybe yeah. it's a sir sometimes but it's never never a name so he has this whole identity we learn his backstory his personal trauma because as he's trying to find out more about his wife he also has his own family stuff that he wants answers to yeah and a big part of why he got into i think this research about fairy tales because Mm -hmm. he wants to find the answer and is terrified of the answer. So he wants some yeah. magic to exist. Um, and I kind of liked at the end of the story that we never got his name, but a part of me was like, oh, that's kind of weird that we never got his name. What yeah. did you think about that? Well, that's like a huge thing in fairy tales too, is like the power of name. Mm -hmm. And like, it is known in most like, belief and mythology systems that like contain like many spirits like fairies or like other such like mischievous type creatures that like you should never give them your name yeah so like if they ask you your name you can say you can call me this yeah or like give them a fake name but you should never give them your name mm -hmm. and that actually explicitly comes up in the story too yeah at one point indigo says to azure like give me your like true name yeah. and like you like i own you forever but like it's kind of said in like a sweet friendship way but like with that undertone of like danger oh uh, yeah <laughs> and azure is like azure is my name and right. indigo is like great i own you now and like i mean obviously the bridegroom had to have told indigo his name right. at some right. point like you don't marry someone without knowing their name but like the fact that in this story he never gives her his name or like she never uses his true name mm -hmm. it's like oh like maybe she doesn't really have power over him actually that's a good point i didn't even see it that way i was wondering if it was just because his part of the story well obviously like important and influential on how the story went mm -hmm. um though again it is not the fairy tales of like disney fairy tales um a lot of those stories that people are i think more widely familiar with the male character is just like the prince like the yeah. he doesn't have a fully developed name or identity even in like those fairy tales yeah um, so yeah i don't know just kind of even though he's a vital role like the the women in the story were just like way more important. I don't know. Yeah, I definitely think there's something to that too, because there's a lot of like play with like flipping gender and flipping. Like he is the masculine role, mm -hmm. but he is a very soft masculine, and like Indigo, like is a woman, but she's like a very like forceful, like masculine, feminine. Mm -hmm. So, 
yes, it, it is a flip. And I, I think that was probably intentional to be like, well, he gets to be the nameless maiden who <laughs> like is a victim because in the Bluebeard narrative, yeah. Bluebeard, the man is the only character that ever gets a name. I think like, really? I don't think okay. any of his wives have names. Okay. Huh. Very interesting. So um, you mentioned how Indigo is kind of the like very dominant, like aggressor type role in this. And I, there were so many points at which you're like red flags everywhere. Um, (laughs) But the one that just really stuck in my mind and I was remembering it as you were speaking, she and Azure have become teenagers. They're like 15, 16. It's summertime and Azur is really strong. by the way we're yeah. into spoilery territory oh, yeah. we, now we, we, everyone <laughs> <laughs> um yes thank you um so Azur is like oh maybe I want to get off of this very microscopic island maybe I want more than just this friendship or there's like kind of a romantic spin to it but like this whatever this soul sister other half situation maybe I want something different Mm -hmm. and so collectively the three of them the aunt and the two girls are going to go to Paris and Azure is so excited she has her passport for the first time she keeps going to like check on it and it's just like I'm so happy for you this is so sweet and like indigo dresses them up for the day like she always does and she's like don't worry about it being uncomfortable you're fine it'll be a short trip and it's kind of like hmm, you're in washington state and paris is pretty far from there so like what do you mean by that but they get on the ferry they go to their like private jet that's waiting Uh uh-oh azure's passport is missing like gone forever missing and they return to the house And there's a full spread of like macarons and flowers and all these things. And Indigo is like, see, it's better than Paris here. And it's just like, wow, we all know that you took her passport and prevented her from having this life experience. Yeah. And nobody can say anything to you. Like everyone is so terrified in this moment. And she's like, la la la, I got my way. And that, that like, really hit me. I don't know. Yeah, (laughs) that was chilling. And that was also the first time in the story, not the last, but I think the first where, like, you get a sense that the aunt is also terrified of Indigo. Yeah. Like, we see the first glimpse of, like, oh, Indigo has control over, like, the adults in her life, too. Yeah. It's not just, like, childhood games and, like, messing with their, like, classmate and, like, just between Azur and Indigo. Um, But, like, Indigo loves that control and she actually loves when people fear her. And that's one of the things that, like, the adult version of her says to her husband, like, I forget what she says, but something about, like, I need you to fear me. Or, like, you don't love me unless you fear me or something like that. Oh, yeah, because he also what started off, he found the like hair bracelet with the A on the tooth. And he was <laughs> like, huh? And we're all like, what? And she's <laughs> like, I am looking at you and you are not scared enough to have found this. So she yeah. leaves. She like leaves him for like several days. And finally, when she like comes back and talks to him, she's like, okay, now you're scared enough. Yeah. Yeah. But he's not at that moment. He isn't. Like, he says he is, but he's lying. And then, like, later he actually is. But, like, that was a very scary... Like, he found a a cut-off braid of human hair that had a human tooth connected to the bottom of it. Um, That was, like, in a, like, statue of an animal that, uh, like, had been in their home for three years and he never knew about. Like, yeah, intensely creepy on, like, so many friends. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, continuing on with the spoilers here, I really (laughs) want to talk to you about how the book ended. Because as Mm -hmm. you were going and we're getting more information, we're meeting kind of in the middle now. The girls are getting older. Um, The bridegroom has met the aunt. He's in the house. He's searching for answers. Mm -hmm. I was pretty sure he was going to wind up dead. I, Mm -hmm. I... 
pretty sure that he was going to die. Um, and I really wasn't sure about Azur. I kind of thought that either she was dead or she had somehow escaped, you know, in the beginning or near the beginning as she's maturing, hitting puberty. She cuts off her hair mm -hmm. because she wants to try to be invisible. Yeah. And so part of me was like, oh, what if she does something that like Indigo hates so much that she's just like, you don't exist to me. Like you are invisible to me now. And then she's just happily living her life somewhere else. Like that's kind of the two directions I saw the book ending. Hmm. So until the like pretty much the end, I was like not seeing where it was going. What about you? I also did not see where it was going, which I'm so glad and also surprised that I didn't because now in hindsight, I'm like, yes, obviously. oh, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there then I was looking through like, yeah, I was looking through Goodreads and a lot of people figured it out early too. And I was like, oh, that's a bummer for them. Like, <laughs> I would have been really mad. But I was like, I don't know. I didn't think that the bridegroom was necessarily going to end up dead. I didn't really know what was going to happen with him. I was more concerned with like, what is happening? Because the whole time... Yep. Azure and Indigo's storyline is building up to when they turn 18, they're going to cross to the other world, like the actual other world. They have like they've this been trying like so long play to other play. world. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And like they've been talking about this since they were 10 years old. So like at 10 years old, it's like, oh, cute. Yeah. Like this thing that you think is going to happen. Yeah. But then they're still talking about it when they're in high school. And I'm like okay, this is feeling like a suicide pact. It is. It like, for sure is. I, like, and I don't know if Azur knows that that's what it is, but I'm pretty sure that's where Indigo is going with yep. this. Yep. And, and you could kind of pick that up, that, like, Azur, maybe from, like, her, like, brain blocking that from her or her mm -hmm. being that manipulated, but she, I think, still thought it was, like, either pretend or, like, Indigo knew something she didn't. And right. Indigo, to me, it was very clear that she was ready yeah. for suicide. like she but then was. I was like well obviously that can't happen because indigo is still alive like we're in she's in the present timeline with bridegroom yeah but we're getting this narration from Azure. so like did Azure write all this down is he about to discover this like book that she like wrote that was like help me right. I'm right. trapped yeah. Like, I kind of thought Azura was, like, literally locked away. Somewhere. Oh, like, literally in the other world yeah. tower. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, what do you think about, so, obviously, Tati being sick, the aunt, like, being sick and dying was mm -hmm. the catalyst for them to go there and these secrets to come up. What did you think about her kind of role at the end of the story as she was just, like, literally in her bedroom? like dying and the story just was like kind of going on around that yeah and it felt like yes she had a big role to play but then she kept kind of like hanging on not that I wanted her to die but like it felt a little bit odd that like she yeah. was just kind of this person in the house that like wasn't really helping anything along in the story but also I don't know it, it felt a little bit odd to me what did you think yeah, I struggled with her character the most because everyone else felt very tangible to me and like they had hopes and dreams and a backstory and like a trajectory. But then yeah. Tati, I was like, she just kind of feels like a character that like, well, there has to be some sort of guardian for this girl. Right. You can't just have her be like a child living by herself in a house. So like, let's give her this guardian. And then, like, there has to be a vehicle that, like, the bridegroom starts to, like, learn the secrets. And, like, Tati kind of, like, gives him some nuggets of clues, I guess. Yeah. So I was, like, I don't know if she, like, had much purpose other than that. And I – that was frustrating to me. But also, I don't know. I want to reread it again and be, like – like, she's also sort of this character that's, like, always sort of, like – they call her a witch when they're younger. Mm -hmm. She always is kind of, like, weird in that she, like, almost feels like she has her toe in the other world, too. Like, she's, she's like, the bridge the character. With the girls playing around with magic because she's like, yeah, me too, right? Like, I... Yeah, I totally. Yeah, yeah. And she's, like, 
believes in the power of hair and like the beauty like human hair she like makes art with it because it is a powerful like vehicle for like preserving memory and like people and like things like that um and then like in the bridegroom narration like she is on death's door like she is like literally like in the doorway between this world and the other world so like i feel like she serves an important bridge piece but i also am like what like how did she come to be here like what is her whole deal i have no idea right yeah a few unanswered questions about her yeah yeah were there any other things that you especially loved or i don't know enjoyed or disliked about the book you wanted to chat about um I really loved, it made me think a lot about, um, especially as the girls are becoming teenagers, mm -hmm. Azur has this desire, as you mentioned, to like literally leave the island and like experience the real world. And they sort of like, the two girls make an agreement that they're going to have these like teenage experiences, which are like yes. sexual experiences, um, because like that is important to do. Um, or Azur sees it that way. Like this is a step, like this is a thing we have to like check off. In our yep. mortal lives before we go to the other world yeah and azura is like no i really just like i'm a teenage I'm like, girl i want to like, like yeah do this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um so like they kind of like give themselves parameters for like how they're going to accomplish this and azura is like oh my gosh i love this like i always want to be out like i want to go to raves all the time i want to go to the mainland and like watch people like walking down the street and like taking business calls and like all these mundane things yeah. and it was just so interesting to me because it's like here's a, a fairy tale about fairy tales about mythology and like these are the types of things that most of us myself especially I look toward to like find a sense of enchantment mm -hmm. but then here is this girl who's in the fairy tale that's like no I'm enchanted okay. by like actual life yeah. like that's where it is yeah. so um yeah to me it was like a real like that was a cool storyline of like the danger of like being too enchanted with the magic is that like like then you like lose your footing for enchantment like you have to be enchanted by the real world too so I yeah know. I, I don't know if the author meant for that but I was like no, I, think, I think um for sure and because with Azur her mom I do think her mom loves her um yeah has gotten herself entangled with this guy who clearly is the worst like Jupiter he is he is terrible and yeah. both because Jupiter kind of has his eye on Azor, and the mom is both like protective of her and jealous of her. That's kind of how she gets so entangled with Indigo to start off with, is because she literally doesn't feel safe at home. She can't be yeah. at home. And so we know that at home she's receiving really no love and care as she should as mm -hmm. a person. And then it's really interesting to me that she goes and spends all this time years with Indigo and her aunt. Um, and they have all the money in the world, right? Yeah. All the money in the world. And yet, even with this other opportunity, she is so sheltered. And so, yes, like going to watch people walk down the street is fascinating to her. Because mm -hmm. like when she is with Indigo, like her blinders are on. It is yeah. just Indigo's world. It is it is not the real world. And yeah, yeah, we don't know if it's even like a real fae other world. It's it's just Indigo's world. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. That was kind of crazy. Even though they like go to school, that really also affects yeah. me. Like they have classmates and teachers and they just like are their own little unit <laughs> to yeah. themselves. Well, it's almost like when they go to school like when they purposefully leave indigo's <laughs> home and realm they like put on costumes like they are dressing as like they're coordinating their outfits so that like they're like the inverse of each other like indigo will wear like a white top and black pants and azura will wear a black top and white pants or like whatever like they'll be like mirrors of each other yeah. and like 
I think like that sort of like has this power of like we are enter like we are still this story that like everyone gets to see and be like intrigued by and like like on display yeah right yeah. but like we are different from all of these people mm-hmm. but then these like couple moments where they're like trying to get kisses from people <laughs> as teenagers and like when I don't know they have to go to the real world and um, Azura sees people walking in the street they're not costuming themselves that way they're like okay now we're teenagers because we have to do this thing that's like part of our mortal experience we're gonna pretend to be separate people yeah yeah I also as you were talking about that they're like teenage experiences the there wasn't an overt like romantic storyline even though you know there's a whole bridegroom and all of that it, it wasn't really like a love story right it was I don't know, little bits and pieces of different relationships here and there. Um, but we have this one little moment when Azur meets a boy when Indigo mm-hmm. is gone and she likes him and she is like, he is it. He likes me, not mm-hmm. us, me. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as Indigo finds out, she manipulates a situation into which she gets to have him first. Mm-hmm. And I was just so, like, upset with her already for, like, all the manipulation you're seeing. And that was just, like, oh, my God. Like, I saw it coming. But, like, how dare you? Yeah. Like, she's 17. Like, that would, like, to anybody. But, like, a 17-year-old, like, oh, my God. You just crushed her entire spirit. Like, how dare you? Yeah. I was very upset with her. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) But there is definitely, like... I mean, I don't feel like either of their sexualities are, like, explicitly talked about in the story. Um, Indigo is married to a man, Mm -hmm. and Azura, like, has this, like, little romantic thing with, like, this boy. But, like, Indigo and Azura are in love. (laughs) Like, in the way that, like, teenage girl, like, best friends who are like obsessed with each other yeah. like love each like they are each other's first love and it's not necessarily sexual but like there there is a storyline here about like the obsession of like first love yeah and like how way. that can like quickly spiral dark and yeah. how like it also is just like there with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And I think Azure was much more open to maybe her own sexuality in a romantic way. Whereas Indigo was very much like she wanted to be Azure's first kiss, but she like didn't even kiss her. She right. bit her. She straight up like bit her on the mouth. Right. Like every other time, yes. Like every other time she was like doing anything with other people, she hated it like it was mm-hmm. just, like physically disgusted by it so for her it felt all about power mm-hmm. like even if it was love it was like yeah the love of being obsessed or the love of having yeah. the power over someone whereas azure i felt like had genuine romantic yes. feelings yeah towards many people <laughs> yeah i agree yeah. yeah but then in the end I don't really understand what Indigo's motivations were. Like, what did she truly want? Why was she doing all of this? Yeah. Like, what actually would have made her happy? Yeah. So after (laughs) there is the dramatic scene, the girls are 18, they're in their other world tower. Mm -hmm. It is quite clear there is a coffin. It is very clear that Indigo... Yeah. It's like a Sleeping Beauty, or no, a Snow White, like, glass coffin. And Azur had already planned to leave. Like, she had already planned, I'm going to run away. Mm -hmm. Um, But that was, like, you know, a horrifying, I think, validation of why she had to. Yeah. And they fight, and Indigo falls from the tower. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the choices that Azur made next? Like... I mean, I I thought it was really interesting that she, like, didn't make any choices. Like, 
it was laid out for her basically like her plan was yeah. that like there was this ball like again so many yeah. like fairy tale yeah. elements <laughs> i love it there was a ball she was going to like slip away yeah indigo wasn't going to notice and azura was going to like escape and have her life yep and indigo's plan was i'm going to kill azura and also herself yeah that was kind but of there's just one coffin it was just the one so were they just but they were both going together. to be there for eternity probably there was going to be at least one death yes but then like it just so happened to azure that indigo was the one who died mm -hmm. it just so happened that there was already a casket that like did indigo even fall into it i know i think she had to like Put her because she fell out of the tower, right? She grabbed yeah. his braid, which had already been cut, so she right. didn't have anything to hold on to, right? And fell. Okay, so is there like put her in the coffin? Yeah, sure. But then she was like, she goes to the now blind and <laughs> yes, to be like, yo, this terrible thing happened. I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. And the aunt was like already feeling like this was going to happen. Like yeah. she was terrified of Indigo and she was like, if Azur, she loved doesn't, get Azur, now, more. If Azur doesn't get out now, she'll be dead. So the aunt right. is like not surprised. Right. But she also didn't know because she's blind right. and Azur was wearing Indigo's perfume. Yep. So the aunt smelled her and was like, oh, you are Indigo and you yep. just killed Azur. And Azur is like, well, I guess I'm Indigo now. Yeah. And, and that just happened. That's into her life, which, like, yeah. And she became the indigo, the indigo never wanted to be. Like, right. she got to travel the world. She right. was suddenly very rich. She had every opportunity at her fingertips. So, on one hand, it's like, oh, yay for you. Like, this is wonderful. You have everything you could have ever asked for. And on the other hand, it's like, your entire life is a lie. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah. But also, like, from the age of 10, yeah, she had been at least pretending, but also somewhat believing that, like, she and Indigo were the same being mm -hmm. that, like, were actually Fae sisters from the other world, that their, like, souls were one, mm -hmm. and that, like, she just didn't know it until she met Indigo. Mm -hmm. So, like... I think she had like been trying to separate herself from that delusion but then like it fell into her her lap where it was like oh wait but actually the promise has been fulfilled like, like I am now not who I was before mm -hmm. this is the, like Indigo's life is the other world and I am like fully stepping into it now and it doesn't come with wings or magic but it does come mm -hmm. like it comes with a lot of money <laughs> Okay, yeah. so now let's say you're the bridegroom and mm -hmm. your wife of three years, you've learned some dark secrets. You found out that she was involved with a death of a very mm -hmm. close friend who she loved mm -hmm. um, and that she is not actually like truly the birth identity of the person who has she has been claiming for many years. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do? Like, yeah, you just sit on that because, like, <laughs> you said at the end, like, I love her. Like, mm -hmm. she, I don't care what name she is calling her. Like, I am here for her. Yeah. I love her anyway, which is like, oh, but it's also like, wait, maybe call the police. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, he, okay, so the context in which he met her, yes. he was attracted to her because she was like, this like dangerous powerful woman yeah so like it's kind of you meet thing. someone like yeah. that and you're like okay you're a billionaire like obviously you have some shady stuff in your past like yeah. you can't okay fair yeah i don't know if she's a billionaire but like you know so now you know the shady stuff and it's like oh but you're kind of a victim to that story but it worked out for you so like you're not all bad right but also he is our expert. Like, he in the story is the expert in mythology and fairy tales. 
Mm-hmm. He knows the rules. And the rules of a fairy tale are if a bargain is made at the beginning of the story, yeah. that bargain will be broken by the end. Right. And that is how you get your happily ever after. Mm-hmm. And he even like said that to himself a couple times throughout that like he was like, I promise this to Indigo, but what Indigo doesn't know is that like in the story, in order to free the person, uh, yes, yeah, yes. you have to break the bargain. Right. So he was like doing it for her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was doing it for him, but he was like, <laughs> I don't know if we're playing by the rules of fairy tales, like this is yeah. what it is. Yeah. Okay. One last thing. And then we've been talking for so long. I should let you go. <laughs> but, um, so the bridegroom has this brother and in the beginning of the right. story, we learn that he thinks he has a brother and then his parents have been telling him basically his whole life that that is a lie and he does not have a brother. And so part of his self-discovery is also like, what is going on? Why do I have memories of a brother? Is that magic? Is that my make believe pretend other world of childhood? Did Mm -hmm. I like cross over? Did I have a fairy friend or did I have a brother and something happened? And that was one other thing at the end of the story that we kind of got closure in that we found out that he yeah. did have a brother who died, um, I think, at the hands of his father, or at least he didn't have no, a he, brother. No, he suffocated in the cupboard because, because of the, the brother told him to go there. And the, the bridegroom told him to go there. The bridegroom was escaping their abusive father. Right. And yeah. so they were trying to leave the house, like yeah. sneak out. Yeah. So, I mean, like, again, another situation that's like, oh, okay, there yeah. are, like, there's a lot of, like, trauma for a real person to discover at this moment in time. And also, like, yeah, I yeah, <laughs> I mean, all three of them, bridegroom, indigo, and azure, are, like, using this fascination with fairy tales and mythology to, like, mask their traumatic situations we don't know as much about what indigos were but we know that like her parents died at some point and she's like a rich kid kind of by herself which like on one hand it's like boohoo for you but on the other hand like that's her parents not a great situation for a child and then azura has a mom who's with this gross guy and like gives azura every indication that she isn't wanted and is asking for it basically any advances that this guy has on her and then the bridegroom like is like literally doesn't remember that his parents were like not good people like he has right. rewritten his memories right he thought they played with him and like had all this yeah stuff. yeah yeah so yeah very interesting of <laughs> this stuff is a form of escape in a dark creepy way yeah and then like everyone confronting the real world and Mm. it also being dark and bad but also enchanting and good if you allow it to be (laughs) yeah i liked i mean i didn't dislike it at the beginning but i think around like the halfway point when like you really started to get these storylines like you had a lot of information you had a lot of backstories I'm a binge reader anyway, but like I couldn't put it down. Like it, <laughs> I am so happy you suggested this because I don't yeah. think it's one I would have picked up for myself. I would have picked it out for you. Like if I saw the before, <laughs> I would like, oh, this like basically says Caitlin on the cover. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I really liked it. So yeah. yeah, thank you for for choosing it. Yeah. <laughs> and if people want to still read How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix, oh, which yeah. is my original pick, um, you can. It is all about creepy puppet dolls, which is <laughs> not, not clear not from the I synopsis, but no. like it is 100% that, and it is clear that it's that from like the first couple of pages. So, like, Grady Hendrix is a very fun author who, like, plays with horror in this like campy way which is why i wanted to read one of his books but um yeah i mean i have it so haunted dolls or not maybe like it'll be my halloween read you know just like 
freak myself out. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Caitlin, thank you for joining me today. It was lovely to chat with you again. Yeah. Thanks for having me again. Hi, Caitlin. Thank you. Bye.